Hi, Robert. Hello there. Um, welcome to Resilience and Renewal, 12 Must Read Books Through the Holiday Season. My name is Robert May, and I'm the Executive Director here at the Kensington in Redondo Beach. And today, um, all of our Kensington Senior Living Communities, three here in California, um, uh, in Sierra Madre, and uh, Redwood City, and our communities, Kensington Falls Church, and Reston, and Kensington Park, Maryland, and another community in Kensington White Plains, all are here to introduce these books to our listeners today and provide a brief introduction. And we have the benefit of Jessica Strand, who's joining us today to share with us her love of literature and um, have chosen a number of books for us to review today. And a good friend of hers, Leslie Jonas, who will be joining us um, shortly as well and sharing all of her experiences in the book industry and working with Jessica for all these years. Jessica is the Director of Public Programs at the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, which we are so very proud to be a part of and support. Um, she's worked in programming for the Alexandria House, the Strand Bookstore, and the New York Public Library before um, founding your own, your own cultural initiative, Dear America. You, of course, contributed to many publications, including the LA Times and Food and Wine and Bon Appetit and more. You're an editor. You love to uh, create and design cookbooks and, of course, have uh, a number of literary anthologies. You also have a, a history of, of literature in your family, and uh, it's just a, a, a fabulous background that you're bringing to share with us and all of our communities today. So welcome. Well, thank you. I I'm, I'm, can't be more pleased to be here. So it's lovely to be here. Um, today, I kind of arranged, we had talked about this. And so I came up with a list. And as we talked, I thought that I would, I would break it up for people. So if they wanted to give gifts or they had particular loves of particular genres, they could listen more closely to those areas. So I broke it into sort of lifestyle books and memoir books and fiction and nonfiction. And I chose four in each area so that people could, um, you know, they would have a choice and they're all very different and from different kinds of writers. And what I thought I'd do is um, just run through them quickly. And then that, Robert, you can jump in and we can yeah. discuss the book a little more fully and, um, and then, you know, and we can talk about this more and then I'll bring on Leslie who is, and I'll introduce her and she's an editor and packager and agent of many books. And we can talk about making of a book and what that means. Um, but during this period of time in which all of us have been um, isolated and lonely and, um, and really looking and reflective on ourselves and where our lives are at and, um, and looking for a place to, when we couldn't travel, travel, and places to dream and places to um, find ourselves again, we turned to books, or many of us did. And so here are the books I chose for this year, which um, the first one is Upper Bohemia, which is by a woman named Hayden Herrera. And it's a story of, uh, sort of 1950s, childhood with uh, two parents, artistic parents, who were involved in writing lots of, um, I would say, biographies of, of famous artists and thinkers. And this family, or this Hayden and her sister Blair, traveled and they lived in Mexico City and Boston, New York and the Cape. And it's really about these two sort of very beautiful narcissistic parents who were focused on their artistic career and really not their children. But what this writer does is through language and through this structure of narrative, and they're very, it's very episodic, uh, able to kind of forgive her family, but also, as I say here, it teaches us on how telling our stories rather than holding them too close to the bone allows us to be free of the burden of our pasts. And I think it's a it's a, a novel because she was able to write all of this. She really freed herself of any kind of 
confusion about her background. It, it just, it, it kind of illuminated it and made it more beautiful in certain ways. The next book is a book called Notes on Silencing, which is by uh, Lacey Crawford. And it's a story, a sort of horrible story, uh, but and a very tragic story of a girl uh, going through um, an episode at St. Paul's School in the Northeast and not being taken seriously and keeping, and the school keeping it silent, which was very sort of, I think, uh, it's 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 timely for what's what's gone on in the last, you know, well it's timely, and now we're we're revealing a lot of what's gone on in many sort of companies, places, schools where things like this have been kept secretive, um, and it's a very mature, thoughtful, beautifully written coming of age memoir, um, and she just wrestles with, you know, it's a survivor story and how, you know how will how she can really learn from from this particular uh, occurrence and and how she, it's 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 not it's not stopped her in her tracks but it's 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 kind of deepened who she is and the last one of the memoir is a book called beautiful country which was a new york times bestseller and it's a story of an undocumented child growing up in new york city of chinese descent and her parents were professors in China, and then they were working as immigrants in sweatshops in New York City. And she grows up and she really just loves to read and becomes a writer and makes sense. And her family really doesn't understand this, but she make, makes sense of her world and, um, and her immigrant past and her parents and all of it through 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 her writing and it's beautifully done and then um, jessica when you were talking about notes on silencing uh notes on silencing you know we had a brief discussion beforehand and of course i think that story also just reflects where you know some of the very difficult journeys that women still face in the world today freedom for women in afghanistan and the right and rights of of um individuals and women there so it is still it's a very major issue in the world today the way women are treated so this book is a little bit of a microcosm of that but exactly uh, it's much broader than just an episode at at a you know sort of wealthy um boarding school it, it's it's um it's it's something that's a it, it's a story that's applicable you know throughout time and also throughout the world at this time it, it is it's a it's an ode to how women can be treated and and silenced yeah. so um, and then we're moving on to a territory that I know, Robert, you have read this book, yes. but the Column Tobin book, The Magician, which focuses on Thomas Mann's life. Um, Thomas Mann was this great iconic German writer, if you don't know who he is. Um, and it talks about um, this kind of vulnerable, complex, interesting man. Um, and I quoted Dwight Gardner, who is, the, who is the New York Times book reviewer or runs the book review. And he says, the magician Tobin seeks to grasp the entirety of, of, of man's life and times a way a biographer might, but he does so quite neatly. Maximalist in scope, but intimate in feeling. The magician never feels dutiful like its subject, it's somber, yet it's always, it's also prickly and strange, sometimes all at once. Right. Um, I, I had trouble with the book, actually. I, I struggled uh, reading it at times. <laughs> and um, though it was, it, was a, it was helpful to understand more about Mon's personal life, which I, I didn't understand. So I think it did a good job of, of sharing what that felt like. But um, it, it was, it, it is such fiction that you're basically following the life of, a, of an author day to day at times. Um, and so there's a lot of supposition in terms of how things might have happened or should have happened or could have happened. A little bit of it is, a, a little bit of it is unbelievable to me. And so, um, you know, there was a very important section where he talks about Schoenberg, who he was friends with. 
and Schoenberg was one of the great um, composers of the 20th century and also had to immigrate to America because of the war. And um, don't worry, we have a puppy here too. <laughs> so annoying. But and, and so, um, you know, some, some of the details there just uh, were, were a little trite. And I, I felt that a lot more detail could have been shared on the part of the author in terms of, you know, Mun's relationship to some of these really important individuals whom he had grown up with and had respected tr tremendously. Um, but uh, it, it's a it's a very interesting novel. I'll give it that. But I did struggle with it at times. I have to well, admit, it's interesting because Co Tobin picks these novelists to sort of delve into the master same thing, which was James. I mean, he has a way of kind of delving in, and either it works or it doesn't. I mean, right. you are given a sense, and it's interesting through fiction and not through biography to kind of dip yeah. in and imagine. So I think probably he does this with his heroes. I mean, I interviewed him once, but it was about a different book. But I have a feeling that these are his literary heroes. And yeah. then tries to sort of get, to try to understand them better in ways. And there are all those, you know, that there, there are a lot of notebooks and, as, and they found a lot of uh, diaries and stuff after. And so he based much of this on that. And then of course, all those holes he fills in with his imagination. Right. So, you know. Right. And, and that is the difference between a biography and fiction that, you know, you have to, you're on this journey with the author and you have to let yourself go. So, um, maybe yeah. I but, you know, I always think this is funny because memoir is a perception. It's, it's your, it's one's perception of one's life. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, and you really, you and, and then it's, it's your perception also of how people reacted to you not what their reaction actually was. So right. it becomes a piece of fiction too, on some level, because, you know, you're, you are, you you, it's your interpretation, which is your interpretation, not everyone's interpretation. That's right. The next book, and I actually had her for a program and she's a wonderful author and she's just a terrific, interesting writer, I, is the book of form and emptiness. And it's by Ruth Ozeki. Um, and she's just imaginative and it's a wild book in which books talk and books have enormous meaning in libraries. And, and I wrote here, the book of form and emptiness gives power to libraries and books as a place of salvation. There, her protagonist can find strength to endure the painful world, which is sort of what we're talking about today. The novel follows Benny, a teenager who hears voices after his father dies. First, he hears his father, then the, uh, the emotions of objects, a pair of scissors, a table leg, a sneaker, and then a book. And the book not only talks, but talks back to Benny and assist him, assists him in narrating this coming of age tale. So, um, you know, here's the book as, as real power, right? The question of okay. what is, how do we deal with grief and grieving? How do we relate to objects around us? All of this is looked at from various angles with tenderness and humor and an acute awareness of the endless continuum which we all inhabit. Uh, Benny finds refuge from himself in a public library where I, objects only whisper. I, I, it reminded me of a quote by Honoré Balzac that you know, reading brings us unknown friends. And so in this novel, you know, reading does that, books become friends. You know, it's a wonderful metaphor for friendship and a library is full of friends, right? The, that, that are just sitting there waiting to be found, waiting to be discovered, waiting to be talked to. It's an absolute fabulous metaphor for um, uh, understanding loneliness or aloneness, but also understanding how to find friends and where you can find friendship in the world. And novels are that place where we can lose ourselves and as you and I commented before, you know, well, by the time we get to the end of the novel, we've lost a friend or the well, friend has, has moved on. And it's maybe we're no longer as intimate with that person, right? They've, they've now left us. So, I mean, what I love about this book is that the book also speaks for him. I yes. mean, uh, which, you know, if books could only speak for us, but exactly. I mean, I think we delve into books and we find refuge in them. And then when they, we have to put them down, we think, oh God, 
where did that relationship go? You know, that this was my, this was, this was what entertained me for so long. And then you go back into books. You know, I go back to books. There's a handful that I go back to every five years, I have to say. And I, they, they mean something very different to me. Or if it's a decade, they mean something so different than when I was like 16 and when I was 30. I mean, all of it. It just, it changes radically. Yeah. Um, so you may read something once and then you read it a second time and your whole world changes because you're a different character and it means it, it resonates in a different way. The last of the fiction is a, is a young writer who's just getting enormous play right now, whose name is Sally Rooney. And I mean, they make tote bags and hats out of, you know, when one of her books come out and it's a beautiful world. Where are you? And, you know, I'm not sure I say here, Ms. Rooney, maybe the flavor of the moment, or in fact, a truly engaging novelist with staying power. Time will tell. But what is certain is that her books are fun and an engaging read. Her latest book looks at two best friends. One lives in Dublin, the other in London, and their lives, personal struggles, and complicated relationships with their boyfriends. They all worry about love, sex, friendship, and the world they live in. Watching these young people navigate the world themselves and each other is constantly amusing and remains one of the year's quick, fun page turners. And honestly, we need page turners. Yes, because uh, a lot of the books here that we, we have are kind of serious and, 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 you know, heartfelt and a really big message, just, you know, important messages. Um, but this is, yes, it's a little more insouciant. It's a, it's a little easier to read and we need books like that too. Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and then I, in the nonfiction area, I, I chose things that were very different from each other. There's, um, there's a, a book called Disordered Cosmos and it's by Dr. Chandra Pescard Weinstein. And Dr. Weinstein's a leading physicist of her generation. And, and she's, tells the story, she's, she's black and she's very, there are less than a hundred American black women to earn PhDs in physics in this country, which is an extraordinarily low number. Um, and she tells her vision and her story of the cosmos and a journey into the world of particle physics, at the same time calling for more just practice in the field of science. She lays out a bold and exciting approach to science and society, which begins with her belief that all of us have the right to know and love the night sky. And um, it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful, I, beautiful book. I, I have to say, this was a, a sleeper at first within the literary um, sort of array that you, you presented us with. But there's, there are two things that struck me about this book and, and our listeners out there really need to go get this book um, if you're interested um, in, in physics. But there is a forward, there's a bedtime story that she relates about how the cosmos is created, which is so moving. By the, and I'm not going to give it away because you have to read the forward. The, it's a bedtime story. By the time you get to the end of it, it'll bring a tear to your eye. And then there's something um, about the, the book's also very moving. It's a, it's a tremendous homage to her mother. Her mother yeah. was this incredible woman of, of purpose, of design, of vision, of, of you know, supporting her daughter and, uh, and her daughter's quest, because she wanted to become a physicist at a very early age. She, she, I think at the age of 10, she says, this is what I'm going to become. Yeah. And, and so it is a, it's a wonderful homage to her mother and a, and a thank you note to her as well. All the deep support and love and, and, and to be in a world where imagine to be one of a hundred really yeah. who's PhD in physics. So it's just an extraordinary book. And then there's a book that got a lot of play, which I put in, which is The New Science of a Lost Art, which is all about breathing. It's by James Nestor. Um, and, you know, I, I think we all, it, it talks about it. I, I say here we do it daily and we don't understand its importance and its benefits. Um, you know, modern research shows how to inhale and how to exhale, how to modify and what to do and how to do it with intention and do it deeply. This not only can change our lives physically, but it benefits emotionally or overwhelmingly positive. Nestor draws upon years and years of medical research. He turns what we know to be true and what we thought we knew into something even more important and vital. You will never breathe the same way 
I agree. I agree. And and it does take your breath away at times. I mean, the, 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 the facts <laughs> that he comes up with and the research that he, he encounters and he presents, it is uh, it's a very engaging read. So as a, as, a, as a holiday gift, I'm giving it on my list to my medically so-called, uh, you know, inspired friends and to share that with them uh, because I think it's, it's, it's very easy to read, but full of great information. And one of my favorite books of the list that we've chosen. Yeah, am I here? I'm looking. I don't, have, I don't know where my blurb went on this, but that's okay. Um, my Broken Language um, is a really beautiful book by, and I'm going to say her name wrong. It's by, uh, she's a um, Latina playwright, Kiara, I think it's Kiara Allegra Udes. And um, it's really about, again, utilizing language she, she grew up in a puerto rican uh family and she is and it's really language and it's really literature that gives her um access into a whole new world and in that world that she is accessing she's able to really appreciate and love the kind of dysfunction and the support and the chaos of this Puerto Rican family. She grew up in, in a Philadelphia barrio and it's just beautifully, beautifully done. And, um, and she's a, a really magnificent writer. Um, and then I got into lifestyle books because we're gonna talk about them with Leslie, but you know, one needs to eat and drink and be merry, um, whether it's the holiday season or not, it's important to, you know, have snacks and a glass of wine once in a while and make a delicious stew or salad. So I chose um, Wine Style by Susan Puckett. Um, this is a really simple, straight- primer. Yeah, it's like a primer for some, for, for, for those who are, don't maybe have a great knowledge of wine. It tees you up, you know, gives you a good background. It's a good introduction to talking about different wines. So it's a really good, cookbook from that point of view i i felt true and i think the pairings you know it, we we sort of always put cheese you know with our wine but it, this gives you little nosh that you're able to put with certain things and mm -hmm. so that you sort of understand flavor and you look at wine maybe a little differently and um it just stretches you and it, i think it brings both like wines if you don't know a lot to a new level and then also how you pair them with something maybe fatty or what the acid means or just looking at how we blend flavors um and um and then i chose the simply julia the julia tertian book who has sort of made her way onto the map and i think is probably and i say here a new member of the pantheon of great cookbook writers i mean she really has become somebody who is incredibly reliable and is and presents very uh accessible straightforward beautiful delicious food and um and they're charming books because she writes really well too yes she does i i was a big fan of this book um i i haven't made any of the recipes yet but there are countless ones that i want to make it's it's that inspiring you know i mean that's what a good cookbook should be you open it up you go i want to make that well exactly recipe after recipe with her is what it felt like I wanted to do because, um, it, you know, the technical skill involved could vary from, you know, from uh, um, a lot of preparation time to very little. It's, and it's called Simply Julia for a reason. And, and uh, so it's really straightforward, but amazing recipes, a great cookbook for the holiday season, another wonderful, wonderful gift. And the last one, well, you know, I'll, I'll give it a, a number of plugs. First, oh, yeah. Thursday, I'm doing a program with this man whose name is Brian Terry. And um, he's written a, 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 a book called Black Food, Stories, Art and Recipes from Across the African um, Diaspora. And 
it is a groundbreaking cookbook. It's been everywhere. It was on the food section of the New York Times, the big story. It's had stories everywhere. It's carefully curated with recipes and essays and art from Black cultures around the globe. Um, it's beautiful. Yep. He writes beautifully. Um, and I have a quote from him here that says, Black food honors our earliest ancestors, today's innovators, and tomorrow's visionaries. It is grounded in the work of the chef Edna Lewis, who celebrated local cuisines with seasonal ingredients and the countless nameless Black women and men who paved way for her. There are more than 100 contributors to this exceptional book. And um, it's a must read and it's a beautiful, beautiful book and a wonderful holiday gift. Yes, and, and just the way it's presented, the cover, the um, it's beautifully embossed. So it's, some, it's a book that you would want to hold on to. Um, it also, you know, we had spoken about this just briefly that there's this great, well, there's two restaurants in town, in town um, which really um, have a history of honoring our earliest chefs who um, cooked for uh, Washington and Jefferson and uh, two men by the name of James Hemings and Hercules Caesar, who are featured in this restaurant. Um, the chef um, um, who, who really, really was interested in bringing these recipes back, these were slaves that were trained in France and cooked for um, Jefferson and Washington, are extraordinary individuals. Um, some of that food can be had here locally. So um, and there was a restaurant called Hatchet and Hall, and the chef now has moved to a new place called uh, Post and Beam, where he's offering up an entire array that would have been served at the time of Jefferson in Washington, and all foods inspired by these black chefs who, you know, changed changed America in a way. And uh, again, you know, we have this wonderful cookbook that you introduced. But here, if we live in Los Angeles, so any of you are close by, I urge you to go check these restaurants out and experience the food. The food is remarkable. And it all started on a Netflix show called um, High on the Hog. Yeah. Where they, yeah, well, where, they, where they introduced these, these chefs and then I realized that the restaurant's here. It's not, yeah. it's not in the yeah. East Coast, it's here in uh, Los Angeles. So uh, well, I love that. that's a wonderful Netflix uh, series to watch too. It's just, it's so moving and it's so beautifully done. Um, so that that's another recommendation for the holidays. Yes, right? but, but this book is a great gift. And just in closing, you know, the power of books is so important. These are gifts that continue, that are gifts year after year after year. And there's nothing like giving a book and there's nothing like receiving one and putting an inscription in it and giving it to your, uh, to your friends and, and your friends will go back and look at those books years upon year after you, they've received them. So I think it's one of the most beautiful gifts one can still give. Oh, I completely agree. And it keeps giving, really. Yeah go back to it or or then you may read it and it might be your favorite book you give it to your child or your grandchild or whomever or dear friend and um you know books are are little treasures and and i think um you know what i mean what would we have been without books in the first place but also during this period of time where we weren't able to do much outside of our homes to be able to travel and to be able to meet new people and to be able to do all these things and it was all through books you know right. and and that's continuing here with our event with you and um, getting to know you and leslie and sharon and all these other individuals who are associated with books and the importance of books in their lives so you know that 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 process is still ongoing and all of our listeners who are tracking and following up following us here as well so um, I, should probably, I should probably introduce Leslie Jonas. Yes, absolutely. So Leslie Jonas is a dear, dear friend of mine um, for many years. In fact, we've known each other practically our whole lives. Um, and Leslie is um, an editor of countless books um, of her own, but then also she worked at Chronicle Books for 17 years and worked on the Tartine book and the Slow Food book and um many many books that you see on the shelves at bookstores in the lifestyle area that have to do with flowers and interiors and photography and food and she's been also uh agent in many projects as well 
And she has also been a packager of books. So she's put together many books um, and found the writer and the photographer and everything else. And then did a very beautiful book um, on her own and raised money for it and had a publisher and stuff, but raised more money called Feed Your People, um, which was a book that went to many of the most famous chefs around the world and had them give recipes on how to feed large groups of people. Um, and so uh, I welcome you, Leslie. Um, and Leslie uh, not only writes, and then on top of all those things, I think I said that, but she does write as well. So um, Leslie and I will talk about books and what makes books. And Leslie and I also have done many projects together. But most recently, we did a little anthology of love poems together, which we'll talk about. So welcome, Leslie. And um, and I guess Leslie's going to ask me questions, and I'll then sort of punt them back to her and ask her some questions. So thank you, Robert. Thanks so much, Jess. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Robert and Jess. And I just want to say it's really exciting to be here talking with one of my favorite people, my favorite collaborators and friends. And um, Jess, it's just been amazing to follow you on your voyage from the Strand, the New York Public Library, and now to the Library Foundation and all the amazing projects that you curate and sort of to be involved in bringing books to life. This is what I really love about what you're doing right now, which is that you're creating these programs that bring books to all different kinds of people in so many interesting ways. So uh, first, I'd just like to ask you, I mean, I've, we've shared our, our we've had many conversations about books, but what would you say your are the most your three of your most favorite books or the ones that have had the biggest impact on you personally? Well, the book that had the most, the biggest impact ever on me um, was uh, William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. Um, I read it when I was 14 and um, it was such an experimental book. I mean, there are chapters that are just one line. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I can write. Things don't have to be conventional. Here's this famous American writer where chapters were a line or three lines. And um, it changed the way I looked at literature and it changed the way I looked at reading and it changed the way I thought um, about books. And then I would say that the second one, there's a very beautiful book by a man who won the Nobel Prize probably like eight years ago, named, uh, could, uh, people say Kutsi, some people say Kutseya, and it's a book called uh, <laughs> Waiting for the Barbarians. And it's um, a really, a very slim novella that is um, just unbelievably beautiful and can take place at any time in history, but it's really about the treatment of people and mankind. And I remember finishing it and just thinking, you know, wow, like that's something incredible. And then I, there is a book, which is a classic. I go back to two classics. And so you only asked me for three, but I go back to two classics and one of them is Howard's End. But the one I go back to, and the one that's my favorite is, um, is Portrait of a Lady, which I know for some takes, it, it, the first hundred pages is a slog. And, um, <laughs> and just go, oh my goodness, how could you? But I think Isabel Archer is maybe my favorite character in literature. Um, she represents in that book, America, where, you know, Madame Merle and um, Gilbert Osmond are the sort of corruption of Europe. And she's so vital and so lively and such a, a really just, interesting dynamic person. And so even my secret password for many years was Isabel Archer. I just think she's great. And I won't say much more if you haven't read the book because much happens to her, but I, I do, it's a book I go back to probably every five years and I find something different in the book when I go back to it. Well, it's funny. Cause actually I, I remember you recommending waiting for the bear rains to me and being, it was like being hit by a tidal wave when I finished it. It was just an amazing book, really intense. But I haven't, <clears throat> I haven't read Portrait of a Lady, so I guess I better give that one a, ch a chance. <laughs> um, also, together programs. 
What, um, what have been the ones that have been the most interesting to you or the most surprising? When you put together a program, what, what are you actually looking for? Well, they're different, you know, I mean, every place I've worked has been very, very different in, in the kind of programming that I do. Um, when I started this, because I was, I, I was, I, I, you know, I, I had, I've had different kinds of careers and I've done this for the last 10, 11 years. As a programmer, I would say, um, I mean, I cut my teeth at this Strand Bookstore, which is an iconic bookstore in New York City. And I made a book out of the interviews and stuff and sold it to Norton Books. Um, but that was really experimental. I mean, I did programming five nights a week. And I, you know, did a lot of cross genre conversations between artists and writers. And we had everybody and it was very unconventional and kind of wild. And then um, I was hired and then it was written about and stuff. And I got signs with the MTA and all this stuff happened. And then I ended up at the New York Public Library where I did donor programs. And then I had my own show where I interviewed called Books at Noon that I made up. And that was exciting because those conversations would, you never knew what would happen. I mean, I always thought, you know, it was kind of like, you, you know, you were interviewing somebody and you wanted the audience really to fall in love with that person so they would buy their book. And, you know, while, and in and, and order for the audience to fall in love with that person, you had to discover that person yourself and they had to sort of open up like a rose in front of you. And then the person went, wow. You know, and I did a lot of different programs there, also public programming at the New York Public. And then I ran my own nonprofit and I did crazy programs that were multi uh, platform with music and there were themes. So there, we did something four years ago on isolation and we had an Afro-Cuban, you know, pianist. And then we had a man who had been in solitary confinement since the age of 14 and got out you know, 23 years later, and we had a writer from New Yorker who had written about one of the Black Panthers. And then we had um, Jenny Livingston, who's a filmmaker who made Paris is Burning and on her new project. So, you know, we would bring these artists together and we would create these shows that were really interesting. And so they're all very interesting. I mean, I, I think I think well, I, th I said this to you before, I, th I think, and then, you know, since I've been at the Library Foundation, I did a very large program a couple of years ago with ta Coates and, and Ryan Coogler for almost 4,000 people in uh, the West Angeles Cathedral. Um, and then, you know, there've been other surprising things that we've done in science and, um, but that was a very, very large one. And I, I think, you know, with each program, I mean, either they work or they don't. And, 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 and you know, it's like any, you, can't, you yeah. can't, you can't always hit it out of the park. But mm -hmm. when it does work, and you have like, I mean, we did a program with Suzanne Sumard, who's, who's the, the a scientist in Vancouver who uh, discovered that trees really do communicate with each other. And she is the, she's the model for the protagonist and and uh richard powers overstory which got a lot of play about a year two years ago and i had her with a young journalist who's got who's a, a, sort of the kind of hot shot the new yorker who's in her 30s named gia talentino and you know their conversation uh was just fantastic and and yet they're like different generations and you know, one's a scientist and one's really a culture writer. And you just don't know. You don't know. I mean, what you hope. I mean, what I try to do is just imagine, you know, really interesting people talking to each other and and how it might blend in some way. And and if it does blend in some way and, and there is some deep connection and they connect on a different level that is unexpected, there's this electric thing that happens. It's like electricity. I mean, it's like a firework. You just and you're sitting there and you go, wow. Like that just, or, you know, with the ta Coates and Ryan Coogler and all these people and everything. I mean, these two black men talking about therapy, you know, in front of 4,000 people. You know, I mean, this just, I think there are these moments where you just don't expect things. And, and they're, and they can be really, really beautiful and really moving. And I think, you know, and then there are other ones that are flat footed and you go, well, we tried, but it didn't really work. <laughs> you know, so um, 
remember when, I was going to say no I, I remember going to see when you interviewed Myra Kalman um, oh, yeah. illustrated Mark in New York and I just remember like all the people in the library you know watching you guys talk and it was very beautiful to watch I think what you're talking about with the electricity and sort of that unexpected excitement is 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 really sort of the beautiful part of what you do I mean it, it's amazing um and then I want to talk to you a little bit about since we don't have so much time a little bit about your own creative process since you are also a writer and you've done a number of projects. Um, and I know that you and I started, when we started, you were doing some cookbooks, but then you went on to do, you did an anthology then of, uh, with the Strand bookstore. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I haven't, I've haven't written much lately. I mean, I, I, um, I haven't put projects together. I, I mean, I would like to do another anthology. I, I'd actually like to do one on, well, I'm not gonna say what the subject is because maybe someone will scoop it. But, I, but, but um, you know, I, I have an anthology in mind, which I've discussed with you. And I think that I will start pulling poems for that. Um, yeah, I would like to start writing again. I stopped for a period of time. I, I mean, I think there were a lot of personal reasons, with, you know, um, moving and sick parents and everything else. And so, um, but my own creative process is like, it, it's, it, there's, there's nothing really, I mean, when I am writing and putting things together and I guess when I'm doing, you know, programming, it's like that. It's sort of like when you come up with recipes cause I wrote like 10 cookbooks or whatever, how many, it's that you kind of go into this sort of odd zone. It's like when you're exercising or, and, and if, or when people meditate, and you, you're in some other space and you're able to really, really concentrate and you're able to really think and you have to make space for it. You have to make space in your brain and in your house and, and, um, and in your heart to sort of be able to sort of open yourself up to do that. Yeah, I mean, in terms of your programs, it does make sense that that would be a similar process. Like in some ways, creating an anthology and creating programs is like these juxtapositions between different pieces of literature and people. Um, can you tell us about one in particular that you found maybe the most surprising? I mean, you've talked a little bit about being surprised, but was there anyone in particular that you experienced where what you went into it with one expectation and it came out the other way? Of my inter of interviews? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a famous photographer named Sally Mann, you know, maybe some people have heard of on this or not. Um, and and she, she wrote a really, really beautiful memoir. And I, you know, I, I had listened to um, her being interviewed on Fresh Air by Terry Gross the night before. And Terry Gross had really gone after her about these photographs she'd taken of her kids, maybe, I don't know, 30 years, 20 years before. And I was told by her publicist not to ask a question. And I had no intention of asking her about that. The memoir is a really, really beautiful book. And so I, I, um, I interviewed her. And in the green room, she was wearing these really great boots. These, she's a, a horseback rider. And I said, I really love those boots. I own those boots now because she gave them to me. Um, but uh, I, um, I, I just, I, I, I didn't know much about her and we just really hit it off. And, and then, you know, the fact is, is that I started thinking about her photographs and she loves Faulkner. Wow. I said, my gosh, you, your photographs, those, those Southern photographs, all that hanging Spanish moss and stuff, they could be like, you know, Faulkner's titles like late in August or absolutely they, they're applicable to your photographs really. I don't know. We went on some reverie and I, we just became, it was one of those moments actually in which, you know, it was a kind of meeting of the minds and there was a lot of um, passion about the same things and, and, and um, a, a real understanding of certain things. And I think that was incredibly surprising. And, um, and then, you know, cut to uh, several years later, she had a show in New York and I went to the show and she looked at me. It wasn't maybe it was a year later. And she said, you know, those boots. And I was like, yeah, because I had said, I like your boots. She goes, you're size seven. Right. And I said, yeah, she goes, I brought them for you. And I was like, <laughs> um, and then I would say, you know, I interviewed my father two weeks before he died. And um, not that I want to bring him up, but, but it was really a surprising thing. And I realized a lot of things about him artistically that I had never known. 
And that also he loved As I Lay Dying, that that was one of the pivotal books in his life. And that um, it was one of, he had read it at like, he was a bit older than me when he read it, which, you know, he's very, he was very competitive. So he was like, well, I guess I was older. And, um, you know, that kind of opened up this sort of new understanding. You think, wow, is it in the genes? Or, I mean, it was just really interesting to me, so. But you didn't know that, Jessica, that that he had read that. You, well, but you didn't know that until you interviewed him. Not at all. I mean, wow. the wonderful thing about interviewing is that, um, I mean, there, there, there are many different kinds of interviewers, I think. There's, there's an interviewer who really wants to sound smart all the time, and you're just really impressed by them. And then there's the interviewer who just really wants to let the other person shine and sort of, and, you know, um, and gets into having a conversation, really. And, um, and we know all those interviewers, and sometimes we love the ones who are really smart and talk a lot. And then there's the other kind. I have a new and I just, when I find something out that's really just a secret or something mysterious, or maybe you're not even a secret, in it, I feel, um, I mean, it's a treasure to take it away and, and really exciting. I don't know how much time, but I thought, you know, we, Leslie and I put together this anthology and maybe we can talk about this poem. Um, instead of end on this, but I, 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 I promised that I would read a poem from our anthology. And I thought that it was applicable to um, just the subject of resilience. Um, and it's a poem by Derek Walcott, who also won the Nobel, I don't know how many years ago. Um, he's a Trinidadian writer. Um, it's called Love After Love. The time will come when with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. That's beautiful. That was actually one of my favorite poem when we were working on that book together. Uh, it was an amazing time to be reading poetry with you. That was the experience that I had when we were able to do that project together. And that is one of the poems that you brought that was so gorgeous. It was really amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, thank you, Jessica. Wow. There, there's something so special about, you know, we all have these poems that we collect and we read. And the, I always enjoy when we can share them with friends after dinner or somehow a poem strikes a notion that we need to communicate and then you can bring that poem out. But I could imagine um, putting that together, uh, um, you know, creating this book of poems would have been a lot of fun. It would have been really enjoyable. It was really fun. Yeah. I'm asking her to do it again, but she's just not jumped on board yet, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the thing I loved about that book is you know, you when you get to know a friend, and this is my pleasure in knowing Jessica, and you grow together as a collaborator. Uh, you know, sharing literature and sharing the pro the creative process is like a great way to be connected to somebody. I mean, yeah. so many wonderful projects create friendships, and it was such a joy to have the opportunity to have a friendship. You know, then become a creative friendship. And Jessica is such an amazing creator of all things: programs, books, friendships. Um, just been amazing to to be a part of that. Are there any other poems we should you should read, Jess? I'm thinking um, that one was such a perfect poem. I also love all the, the Neruda poems were also very beautiful. And I'm yeah. trying to think of what other, there's a poem with your dad in there too. Oh my goodness. I think, um, you know, well, you're the creator of many great things. It's very flattering for you to say that, but I um, I can read, um, there, there are many, poems is there one you're thinking of Leslie maybe you want to read one or is there I mean I, I don't know I, I, love, don't have the fun. I love I mean it's, it's also an illustrated book but I love a poem that's a kind of difficult poem but it's a famous poem 
by Elizabeth Bishop. And I don't know, it's not as, it's, it's, um, it's about losing love. So, um, but I don't know if that, that, that tonally is right right now, but um, I, um, well, do you, you remember how the publisher though, it's funny when we started the book, we were calling it love lost and love found. And the publisher didn't want us to put loss in there, even though like 95% of poems are about loss, you know? That's so right. I think, That's I think it'd be interesting poem. to read that. That's why it becomes such a great love poem. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I read this one because it really is great. It's about Elizabeth Bishop, who is a great, great female poet who has been kind of after, you know, posthumously looked at it really seriously. I mean, she was when she was alive, but people really have... Um, sort of delved in and made documentaries and, and are trying to make films. I think there was even, I think there was a fictional, uh, not a fictional, but a, a film about her life. A fictional film, but a film. Um, it's called One Art. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day. Except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent, the art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch and look, my last or the next to last. Of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster. Some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I miss them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love. I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like it, write it, a disaster. So beautiful. My goodness, gives me chills. Now we do have to do that next book. <laughs> there you go. We should definitely do it, for sure. <laughs> that inspired you, Leslie. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, you know, I think about doing a book is that, you know, when you enter into it, it's, um, you know, you enter into a big process, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, I find writing a book or being involved in, in books, just every single one is a, a kind of deep adventure. So I always have to take a deep breath before I can dive into the next project. But um, Jess, maybe we should talk a little bit about that next project, because it fits in with the theme of, of this whole process in terms of what the, the idea of resilience, I think that was the idea that, that you had, had come up with. Well, yeah, well, now we've given it in a way, but I think there should be a, a book on resilience and renewal. Um, there's certainly a lot of poems that, uh, that touch that uh, beautifully. And I think we need to know that we're all resilient, but that we also, there will be a renewal at some point and that the renewal happens seasonally, but it also, um, is important to be able to read poems to inspire us. Um, and, um, you know, you've been very flattering, Leslie. Leslie has done about 3 million projects. So she, it's like, you know, it's like someone made an enormous salad and, you know, I, I have like my tomato salad, but Leslie has made like a salad that's like as big as my office. And it's full of like every kind of vegetable you can possibly imagine. So I'm, I'm flattered. Um, by your your niceties thank you and um and i think we covered yeah. a lot of really beautiful books today yes we have and <laughs> and and we still have another friend that we have to introduce of course is sharon so my colleague who's the director of major um gifts and uh, planned gifts um at the foundation the library foundation of los angeles is going to you know sharon padua is going to give the winners of the raffle. Um, and Sharon has been really wonderful because she has been, you know, one of the hearts behind this whole series and our organizers and, and gatherers of information and thoughts and everything else. So I'm, I'm very grateful to her for everything she's done. And, um, and she will introduce and talk about the foundation a bit. And she will also tell us who the raffle winners are. 
So welcome, Sharon. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Leslie. And thanks, Robert, for a really fun and engaging program today. Um, I do want to say thank you to Kensington for continuing this partnership with us. Um, as many of you might know on this call, the Library Foundation is a nonprofit, um, and we exist to provide support for the Los Angeles Public Library. And at the end of every year, we do a year-end fundraising campaign. And what we do is we raise funds that will go back towards the library to fund um, efforts that support early literacy, lifelong learning, um, and cultural programs. And this year, Kensington has been extremely generous and has provided $2,000 matching grant for us. And so thank you, thank you, Robert, and thank you to everyone on the Kensington team to make this happen. Um, and you know, we this program will be will be going on through the end of the year. So if you're interested in participating or learning more, just visit lfla.org slash give. And as mentioned, uh, in the spirit of the holidays, we are going to give away three gift bags and they'll have a few little gift items from our library store, which is located in Central Library in LA. Um, uh, we randomly selected three names from today's attendee list and the lucky winners are Jennifer Late, Judy Stone and Robin English. So I will be emailing you three after the program to work out the delivery of your gift. I do want to mention that Leslie and Jess are curating another program just a few days from now on Thursday, December 2nd, um, and it will feature three cookbook authors from diverse backgrounds, um, including Bryant Terry, who Jess mentioned in her book list, and I'll put the link in the chat, um, but we'd love for you to join us um, if you're afraid. Um, I think lastly, I just want to say thank you again to Kingsington for this partnership. Um, and just happy holidays to everyone. I hope everyone uh, got some good takeaways for books to read, either for yourself or your friends or your family. And uh, yeah, to enjoy reading and for all that it brings each of us. So I'll bring it back to Robert. Thank you, um, Sharon. We here at the Kensington would like to thank everyone again for your participation. Jessica, always you're sharing your love and passion for literature. Um, we greatly, um, and deeply appreciate you and um, thank you so much. Leslie, a uh, pleasure to get to know you a little bit better today and all of your contributions and, and your, your uh, love of literature as well. I think that this is what this is all about. It's about loving books, about loving the world we live in. And the world is full of stories and stories that we need to share with each other. And um, I'm so pleased that we were able to do a little bit of that today. And for all of our participants, thank you for joining us and being on this journey along with us in the Kensington and uh, this uh, journey of finding new new books to to uh, discover. Well, thank thank you, and thank you, Kensington, for having uh, for having this discussion with me and with Leslie and with Robert. And um, I feel very honored and um, and read away and keep enjoying those books and a very happy holidays to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.